cage the beast, the beast gets angry. It's hard to believe, but superhero movies have been dominating the box office for over 20 years. Marvel Studios ramped up the production of these movies, so we get at least two a year now. But that wasn't always the case. Superhero films used to be an event when they would hit theaters. You can credit Blade for bringing them to the forefront after Batman and Robin killed them off. Blade showed you could take the source material seriously and get a great film out of it. Sam Raimi then showed studios with Spider-Man that if you put a big budget into them, you could really light the box office on fire. The film that really seemed to push the superhero movie forward, though, was 2000's X-Men. For comic readers, it was no surprise that the X-Men did so well as the comic had been number one at the newsstands for quite a while. One of the most popular characters was the mysterious Wolverine, a character so mysterious that even he didn't know his origin story. Put as the center point of the X-Men film, the character immediately grabbed fans and people loved Hugh Jackman's turn as the character. It was a no-brainer to spin him off into his own film, but when X-Men Origins Wolverine hit theaters, fans were less than pleased. The film missed with both critics and comic fans alike. Now, where's Victor? And if they were going to do a follow-up, then they were going to have to retool the direction they were going in. One thought was to bring in indie filmmaking darling Darren Aronofsky to bring a classic Wolverine comic to life. It ended up not happening, but let's find out exactly what the f happened to this unmade movie. were excited when X-Men Origins Wolverine hit the big screen, but as they were walking out of the theater, that excitement had turned to utter bewilderment. Not only did the movie not really live up to their expectations, but it turned one of the most popular X-Men characters, not named Wolverine, into a shirtless amalgamation of numerous mutant powers with no mouth. What happened to Deadpool is ripe for a video all on its own. But let's move forward. Knowing that they would want to do another solo Wolverine movie, Fox was smart enough to start looking for writers and directors before the first film hit the big screen. One person they had worked with on films such as Black Swan and The Wrestler was Darren Aronofsky. His films were a hit with critics and audiences alike. The studio thought he might be able to bring some imaginative ideas for a comic book movie. Hugh Jackman had been disappointed with how audiences received the first Wolverine movie and hoped with Aronofsky on board that it would take the character a little more outside of the box than what had been done before with superhero films. Jackman told Entertainment Weekly, he's a visionary. I've been trying to get Darren since X-Men 3, really. We had a meeting about three weeks ago, catching up as friends more than anything, and he just ran a few ideas by me and my eyes just lit up. Because I already, I think, this is like a whole new ball game. Just the ideas, the level of depth and intelligence and creativity. I think he's been waiting so long to do a movie in this genre. When he found the script, he said, this is it. It's really exciting. The script he was talking about was written by Chris McQuarrie, who was known for having written The Usual Suspects and The Way of the Gun. He took the famous comic book miniseries of Wolverine in Japan and adapted it. While knowing that it had to be set in the world of the cinematic X-Men movies, he tried to do something a little different with it. In it, Logan was the only mutant. No one ever talks about other mutants. He thought it would help the character stand out among a real-world setting. He stated, he was the only mutant in the movie. It was what you'd imagine the Wolverine universe to be under the control of someone who wrote The Usual Suspects in the Way of the Gun, and is a fan of Sergio Leone. It was Kurosawa's Wolverine. There was a real romance to it, there was a real humor to it, and a very straightforward sort of plain-faced brutality to it. The film McCory wrote hems closer to the comic series it's adapting than what we ended up getting on screen. It dealt a lot more with tribal feuds and gang warfare amongst the various entities in the Japanese underworld. Wolverine gets poisoned, but all it does is lessen his healing factor not completely eliminated as it does in the theatrical movie. His immortality doesn't play into the story at all. One of the biggest changes is that this movie isn't specific to any era of Logan's life. This could take place before the first X-Men movie or after the last. The guilt dreams about Jean were written into the script after Macquarie and Aronofsky had left. Instead of Yukio, an old man named Zed is responsible for bringing Logan to meet with Yoshida. He has a file labeled Project Wolverine that contains information on Logan's past and what was done to him during the experiment that made him what he is. Zed will only give him the whole file after he has met with Yoshida. We also get a glimpse at a different backstory of the relationship between Logan and a young Yoshida. Logan gets caught in a pit with bamboo spikes. Yoshida tries to decapitate him with a sword and finds out about his healing factor. After a sword fight, Logan lets the young officer go. When Logan goes back to Japan to meet with him, he finds out the old man has already died. 
They attend his funeral, things play out similarly to how it did in the Mangold film, but the Yakuza targets Shingen instead of Mariko. When they escape, Logan and Mariko hide out sort of like they do in the film. Mariko eventually returns to her father for their arranged marriage between her and Noburo. Logan, on the other hand, heads off to confront the head of the Yakuza. They claim they were offered the hit at the funeral, but they turned it down. It's then said that some of the lower level men must have taken it against their orders. They clue Logan in on Noburo's corrupt dealings. Logan then confronts Noburo, but is told Shingen is actually the corrupt one. He involves himself with the criminal dealings to make back the money that Yoshida has given away for altruistic pursuits. Then Viper, Noburo's secretary in this version, bursts in and shoots Logan with some poison arrows. Logan then ends up on the run. Throughout the film, we see that Logan is being stalked by the Black Clan. They pick Logan or Shingen to be their new leader, but they have to duel in a battle to the death to determine who it will be. They are represented as the group that makes the real decisions in Japan behind the scenes. Whoever leads the Black Clan will lead the country. This also leads to another dropped plot thread of the Silver Samurai. It's revealed to be the illegitimate son of Shingen named Kenuichio, who plans to challenge whoever wins leadership of the Black Clan. It seems overly complicated, but it only gets more complicated after Logan finds out that the previous leader was in fact Yoshida. He had become the leader of the Black Clan after their encounter during World War II. Shingen found out and wanted to challenge him for leadership. Not wanting Shingen to lead the Black Clan, Yoshida killed himself and had Zen find Logan as he thought he was a worthy candidate to lead the group. Kenuichio then kidnaps Mariko and Logan follows them to the Yoshida stronghold. Here the battle goes from Logan and Shingen dueling for leadership of the Black Clan to an all-out war between Logan, Kenuichio, Shingen, Yukio, and Viper. Logan finally wins and is granted leadership of the Black Clan. Ninjas emerge from all over to acknowledge him. He sends Mariko and Yukio away, saying he has to deal with them. When he emerges, he tells them that he ordered all of them to commit seppuku, suicide. Logan and Mariko have the same goodbye that we saw, only with Logan leaving on a ship instead of a jet. Mariko is the one who says she has responsibilities and says goodbye to Logan. He finally gets his Project Wolverine file, but we see him throw the pages off the deck of the ship into the ocean. It's never said if he looks at them or not. The script seemed overly complicated and jam-packed full of story. If there is anyone that would have been able to make sense out of it, it would have been Aronofsky. Jackman loved the script, and with Aronofsky on board, was excited by the direction the film was moving in. He loved that it went in a darker direction than the previous film had before. With all the creative people in place, he said it definitely had some meat on the bones, and that there would be something to think about after you left the theater. Aronofsky had mentioned in interviews that he was excited about the film, saying it had elements of samurai films and that he loved Japanese movies. He wanted to do something really cool with it. Originally, Jackman had said this would be a follow-up to the previous Wolverine film, but Aronofsky clarified that the film was actually a one-off film that wouldn't have any connections to the previous film or possibly even any of the X-Men films outside of Wolverine himself. Everything seemed to be moving forward, but then news broke that Aronofsky was dropping out of the film. Fox moved ahead with a list of directors in mind to replace him. On the list were Jose Padilla, Antoine Fuqua, Mark Romanek, Justin Lin, Gavin O'Connor, James Mangold, and Gary Shore. Mangold would win the job and go on to make the film we saw in theaters. New writers came on to rework the script, but there was still a solid foundation built by Macquarie that remained. It ended up veering closer to the X-Men films, but still kept at least a little bit of an edge to it. In 2014, Aronofsky was interviewed by MTV News about his upcoming project, Noah. During the interview, he was asked about leaving the project, and he replied, I loved the script, and I thought the film came out great. I just had... It was a hard time in my life. It was complicated. I couldn't leave New York for that long an amount of time. And, to be honest, the possibility of Noah had started to emerge, and here was something I'd been thinking about for years. I was really excited by that. Aronofsky was going through a divorce from actress Rachel Weisz at the time, and didn't want to leave his young son. Spending almost a whole year in Japan for the film just wasn't feasible. Of course, there were conspiracy theories as to the real reason for him leaving the film. Some speculated that he never wanted to make the film and only signed on to broker a deal to make his other projects, and then came up with an excuse to leave after the deals were set up. Others said that he might have left after doing a rewrite of Macquarie's script. The story was going to be a hard R and Fox wouldn't approve his draft. Regardless, we're left wondering if Aronofsky's version of the film would have mm, been 
better than what we got. The X-Men franchise moved on, and Hugh Jackman would play Logan three more times before he retired from the role. Curiously, if Aronofsky had made the Wolverine, you have to wonder if the film Logan would ever have been made. James Mangold entered the X-Men fold with this movie and co-wrote and directed Logan. Could we have seen Jackman end his run with a different story? Let's not think about it too much, as it ended about as perfect as we could have hoped. Snicked.